I want to begin this discourse or interaction with a confession. These two days I have been with you have made me two days younger. It reminds me of those days in mid-1960s when we had the same struggle going on in North America and as a student doing his PhD there I was involved like you energetically day and night in the work you are doing in this country. So accept my congratulations. I feel delighted. I feel more strong. I feel more younger when I am with you. Um, permit me to make a slight detour in the discussion. This morning we heard a beautiful prize citation of Surah Hujrat. And I was expecting that we will have most of brothers and sisters there to listen to the Talawa in Sratul Fajr and think about it. I was thinking to make a footnote on what was said by the scholar this morning. I delayed it because I thought better for me to make those few comments when most of you are here. When I was listening to the recitation of the Quran by the Mukhre in Salat, I found there were three lessons for me. First and foremost, that there is going to be an ethics which has three dimensions. First, organizational ethics. Therefore, the surah begins by telling us when you have an organization and you have people who are responsible then how should you behave with them? So the Quran tells the followers of the Prophet peace be upon him you should not raise your voice above his voice nor proceed over him in your actions. It was not a physical advice. It was a conceptual advice. You cannot put your ideas above his ideas, your own concepts above his concepts, your own conclusions above his, his conclusions. Because the Quran has said elsewhere, If you follow the Prophet, peace be upon him, you are following Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's command. Mahjid Rasulullah Therefore, first thing that I thought I should contribute in the morning was organizational ethics. Second, personal ethics. That how should I behave as an individual? Should I have jealousy? Should I have a mind to look around for weakness of people? Should I look around for their shortcomings? Enjoy their shortcomings? Spread rumors about them? Therefore, what should be my personal ethics? And thirdly, what should be social ethics? When we have a society, in that society, how are we going to behave among ourselves? Are we people who claim to be Arabs and Turks and Malaysians, Indonesians, Turks and Pakistanis and feel proud of nationalities? Or are we going to be a people who are cemented together by the Ikha of Islam? and by the mission of achieving taqwa as much as possible. These three lessons were on my mind when I listened to the Imam reciting the Quran this morning. And I thought 
that I should add that as a footnote after the prayer was over, but I delayed it till I find brothers and sisters together in this place. With that detour, permit me also to say a few words about how I look on the history of Islam and history of Muslims. There are several approaches to understand history. One is that it is circumstances, environment and time that creates leaders. The other is there are heroes who are charismatic, they set the stage and they start moving. Both may carry some truth, but not total truth. Truth remains somewhere else. Truth remains in what Abu Bakr said when Prophet passed away. He said, those of you who worship Muhammad should know he has passed away. Those of you who worship Allah should know he is all alive. These few words speak for the worldview, philosophy of history and concept of leadership in Islam. A leader is not a person for whom you should wait. Leader is a person who is in you. If you are mission oriented, if you know your destiny, if you are confident about your objective, then you are leader. If we have Umar al Farooq today, not Salahuddin, and you kill him, you kill only a person. But if you have one billion Umar Farooq, can you kill them? Can you remove them? Can you defeat them? Therefore, Islamic concept of history is not hero-centered. It's not based on waiting for a messiah. That's a typical Jewish concept. Before them, Babylonian concept. A messiah may come. We don't have a messiah. Islam wants every individual to be a qaid. Therefore, you don't have a pontiff, you don't have a pope, you don't have a priest, but any Muslim who is practicing, who knows the Quran, who is respected, can be asked, please come forward and be our Imam in prayer. Please come forward, lead the janaza. Please come forward and perform nikah. We don't have that concept of priesthood. Who is a pontiff of Muslims. Therefore, Islamic concept is that of transformatory leadership. Which transforms. Once you have transformed the basic substance of society, you don't need one single individual. Now each one should know their destiny and direction. The Quran gives a very interesting example of ants. Ants even don't have eyes. But they know where they are going. Each ant knows their destiny. They know very well one ant cannot live without the other one. They know very well one ant cannot lift a cockroach. But 25 ants join and lift the cockroach without a king around them. They don't wait for Messiah. Each one of them knows what is their destiny, what is their objective and therefore we don't have to wait for Umar al Farooq to come and be born. Each Muslim has to be Umar Farooq. Each Muslim has to know what is his destiny, objective, what do you want to achieve. 
in that case no one can defeat Muslim Ummah Muslim Ummah is a matter of a concept a mission internalization of Islam once we internalize that then it becomes a movement therefore history for Islam is a movement not a narration of facts facts can be solid past and dead movement remains dynamic therefore once Islamic movement comes into existence then this movement must keep on following definitely you need always some organizers some people to facilitate leadership is not more than facilitation leadership which does not share its vision with the followers is no leadership at all leadership means sharing your vision sharing the strategy sharing the source development and strategic thinking if you don't have that one individual cannot be leader unfortunately Muslims for centuries have been waiting for someone whom they have, should have never waited it is they who are to do their work they who have to change the world they who have to bring a new era of prosperity and development sorry for this detour I thought I should make these two brief comments before I talk about my subject the topic originally was what the world missed through degeneration of the Muslims I don't like the word degeneration a negative term so I changed it taking some liberty although it is not polite on my part to do that I thought Muslims have made contribution and degeneration is a specific mental disease which I don't think Muslims have because wherever I go in Japan, in China, in Australia in North America and Europe I find most educated, enlightened, intelligent minds among Muslims they are at the top of engineering, computing, medical sciences, pharmacy, social sciences I cannot call them degenerated Muslims they are highly talented they are highly enlightened they are highly respectable persons therefore what I want to share with you in very brief words is what Islam made as a contribution and when this contribution became a bit fossilized what happened to the world for that as you will see brother this is not moving <coughs> ah. or, or maybe yeah, I'll download yeah, it from here okay thank you, thank you. Um, I will not go in historical resume I don't like to go on historical facts at all although I'm trained as a historian uh, I'll just touch on these few points and leave it to your imagination to fill those gaps and then raise questions when we have time for it we know very well the condition of world civilizations when Islam came was horrible they talk about Rome, Persia, India, Arabia all of them were suffering from ethical and moral decline political disintegration social crisis at the same time cultural decay all this is known to us throughout the books of history what was done by Islam was essentially a paradigm shift which I call culture of revealed knowledge this revealed knowledge was given to humanity as ultimate knowledge and ultimate truth Al-Haq 
this ultimate knowledge provided them what is nature of reality what is nature of humanity what's nature of universe all three aspects together should we feel a tiny insignificant person in universe or we feel the whole universe has been made subservient for us tasheer of this corn for human beings which means you have no more to fight to conquer universe which has been the basic assumption of empirical science similarly it meant that your lifestyle is to be modeled with a new dimension you don't decide for yourself with a very finite mind and the so claimed unlimited memory of your computers with all those claims the mega mega computers cannot be compared with a small part of human mind a small part of human mind can store more knowledge retrieve it and translate it and interpret it while computerized knowledge can never interpret can only give you feedback feed in and feedback nothing more than that therefore this revealed knowledge provided a new vision of life new vision of universe new vision of humanity and that became the beginning of a new culture and civilization it was not an evolution of arabian culture into islamic culture it was not a matter of arabian dress to become islamic dress not a matter of arabian food to become islamic food not a matter of arabian language to become islamic language and allah sent messages in syriac in hebrew he is not confined by arabic therefore it was essentially an islamization of arabic language islamization of customs and traditions and only those customs and traditions were allowed to survive which were according to islamic values its values which came from divine revelation that gave birth to a culture and civilization the whole cycle of birth of civilization is different it's not based on the so called western or eastern understanding of evolution of culture and civilization secondly it was production and dissemination of knowledge therefore the quran made it obligatory that you must be a people who know who understand who analyze ilm ma'rifa tafaqqu tadabbur tafheem ta'allum not one but so many terms used again and again on every single page of the quran i not a people a qaum who uses aql a qaum who uses faham a qaum who uses tadabbur and so on and so forth therefore a culture of creating knowledge and disseminating when muslims became consumers of knowledge then they had what our brother bin nabi has said coronizability that you feel proud in using jargons of the west to show you are intellectual if you find somewhere someone saying there is a, a renaissance you start saying when you renaissance in islam never knowing what the meaning of renaissance of what for europe it was re-emergence of the greek thought for islam it can never be like that for islam 
you have the Quran and Sunnah shining. You don't have to go back to Islamic Arabia for your sons. Therefore, when we are intellectually, socially, culturally enslaved, that's what Bin Nabi calls connoisability. Islam wanted production of knowledge, not consumption. We have to change our attitude. Not to consume, but to produce. When we produce, our products capture the market. Now we are consumers. Ideas, theories, concepts produced by others are taken by Muslims. Leaders or non-leaders makes no difference. They use same language and jargon and feel elated as if they are enlightened. One single word, globalization. And you find there is no Muslim ruler who will never use this word with pride as if something has been discovered by him. They never know what's the meaning. Third, emphasis on research, investigation and critical thinking. When you find Sayyidina Ibrahim and others raising critical questions, can we afford that kind of questions in a seminary in a Muslim society today? Can a student of a Shaykh al Hadith raise those questions in the class which he raised to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Critical thinking. How you do it? Why you do it? Show me. Now without that critical thinking, we cannot be leaders. Leadership means when you have that approach and you are the leaders. Don't wait for someone to come. You are the leaders. Because you have been able to acquire what is current knowledge and you have joined here your brothers and sisters to understand what is your Turas, what is your heritage. Your Turas is not Arabic Turas, but Islamic Turas. Islamic Turas means Islamic values in the Quran and Sunnah, which are universal, which are not confined to one region, one nation, or one time. Therefore, the paradigm shift which was brought focuses around these three important aspects. <coughs> Muslim political science and technology is known to us and Brother Mohsen has made it easy for me this morning by referring to what was done in Spain and elsewhere. The same was done in other parts of the world by Muslims. They led humanity in scientific development, in technology, in coming up with improvisation which cannot be even understood today. If you just try to find out about the waterway system made in Spain by Muslims, how they brought water from sources, how they were able to create a system of water pressure on one and same level where the water rises to certain level in one point and not in that point. Some of the very primitive things they did are taken as highly cultured aspects discovered by the West after centuries. Muslim shower which you have today is not what Europe has discovered today. This is essentially a Muslim device used in Spain by Muslims and neglected by the Europeans. They neglected it for centuries till they discover again after trial and error this is the most hygienic scientific way of living a better life. Not one but hundreds of examples can be given. Therefore I don't about that. 
I have just touched on these aspects where Muslims made their contribution. But what was the problem? The word degeneration used in the original title is modified here by me. I believe that decline of Muslim political power had essentially these five factors. First, dilution of faith. They started following the path of other nations for whom religion was ritual. Religion was a matter of certain ceremonies. Religion was a matter of a Shaykh islam He should do Islam for us and we enjoy our life. Therefore, dilution of faith. Islam wanted every single believer to be a knowledgeable Muslim. A Muslim who knows how to differentiate between halal and haram in chemistry, in physics, in engineering. What kind of space engineering is human friendly, therefore halal? What kind of space engineering is human enemy, therefore haram. What kind of medicine is going to uplift humanity, therefore halal. What kind of laser surgery will create a problem for humanity, therefore haram. Genetic engineering can be approached from these two perspectives. One, what someone calls playing gods. The other, what is serving humanity. But how do you decide about it? Should I decide? No. Islamic principles of halal and haram, of masliya amma, of what is tarjih, what is priority, all those principles given by the Quran and Sunnah and deviled by the Fuqaha are to be taken into consideration. Only then you can decide about it. Therefore, when we have dilution of faith, then we have no more progress and development which is cohesive, which is integrated, but we have a diversified development. Secondly, internal divisions and you heard a lot about it. Even today, if Muslims are divided in terms of their fiqhi masalik and even in one and same fiqhi maslak in terms of mosques and centers who don't have their hearts and minds wide enough to accept differences, then we cannot play our role. Thirdly, adoption of Greek thought. Adaptation and adoption are two separate things. Islam is for adaptation, not for adoption. Islam allows a believer to adapt things which are suitable and in Islamic framework, but does not allow to adopt things. Adoption means when you have the whole system taken. Adaptation means you use critical mind to find out where we have some conflict, where things are in line. Therefore, when we adopted, and for that matter, if we adopt Western democracy, if we adopt Western culture, if we adopt Western food, if we adopt Western architecture, in all cases we are losers. I have seen in my own eyes in many Muslim countries, architects who are trained in France, Germany, America and elsewhere, when they go back to their own home countries, without knowing the climatic conditions, they replicate the kind of homes, the kind of buildings which they learn to make in their western 
experience. They have no idea about airflow, no idea about heat, no idea about insulation difficulties. Just replicate because their mindset has changed. That's adoption. But if they use technology, if they learn methods, but have adaptation, changes. Muslim culture adapted a number of things, but everything was transformed. We used red stone, we used white marble, we used sandstones as main substance. Even some pillars of earlier people, but all those were transformed into a new structure. If you visit Jame Kurtova or Jame Umvi or many others, you can see with your own eyes how local substance was used with one single concept of one single civilization globally. You travel from one place to the other end of the world, whether in Central Asia, whether in uh, Spain, whether in Middle East, elsewhere, and you will have one and same civilization same culture, same concepts, although substance will be changed. This is the power and beauty of Islamic culture because of value-based system. Value is one and same. And that value reflects itself in all those manifestations. Next, dualism in life. That life was divided in two sections. A sacred and a secular realm. When they want to go to masjid, they would like to put a specific kind of dress, a prayer hat, make wudu, on Friday make ghusl. But when they go to a workplace, they will never worry about does their body smell or not. This is division of secularity and sacredness. When they go to masjid, they say, Allah, you are ala, azim, akbar. When they are back in factory, they say, Uncle Sam, you are great. Your system is better. Dollar, you are great. Money is God. Glamour, you are better. Glamour is my God. So if I am popular, people like me, then I am a great person. All these gods come back when they leave the masjid. This is duality. When they go in their home, then whatever is demand of their family becomes halal for them. While same was haram when they were in masjid. This dualism has been one reason for that problem. And lastly, ethnic and nationalistic trends that we are uh, Yemenis, we are Arabs, we are Indonesians, we are Pakistanis, all these ethnic and nationalistic trends. Iqbal in one of his very famous couplet says among the modern gods the biggest is Watan. Then he says whatever is the dress of this god of Watan is the coffin of the Muslim Ummah. And we worship that Watan. We worship that ethnicity. We worship that blood relationship, that linguistic approach which was condemned by Islam completely. These are just a few of those aspects. Now, having said that, I see a very obvious Islamic revivalism in the 20th century and that is reflected first and foremost in the holistic view of Islam as the way of life not as religion 
Secondly, as Islam understood as deen and not as religion. Third, Islam having its applied dimension of Tawheed, not just a matter of Aqidah. I discussed this yesterday in a bit detailed manner, but it needs much more detail for which we don't have time. And I see that role of Muslim reformers, revivalists in this age has made Islam much more vibrant reality. Then the question arises, is there a place for religious fundamentalism in Islam? When we say Islam's revival, does it mean that Muslims, when they go back to the Quran and Sunnah, can be called fundamentalists? The topic requires extraordinary careful study. The terminology, its meaning, implication, history need to be explored. I am not aware of a single Muslim scholar who calls himself or defines Islam as person who is Asasi as person who is concerned about